Hello, Paul Awarder here. I'm the Clinical Director for Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins Hospital and also uh, ad advisor for the Medscape Infectious Diseases pages. The topic that I thought I'd uh, speak a little bit about today has to do with an old workhorse of uh, infectious diseases and other physicians and that is Piperacillin Tazobactam or Zosin. This is the drug that's been available for quite a while, in fact actually is off patent and has been widely used for pneumonia treatment, sepsis, intra-abdominal infections, uh, post-operative infections, and so on. Uh, the reason I thought it would be worth uh, spending a few minutes talking about this is something that uh, was triggered by a discussion I had with Sarah Cosgrove last week who uh, runs our antibiotic management program. She alerted me to something that I think many of us who have looked at uh, antibiotic susceptibilities of various bacteria have probably seen but maybe not uh, really uh, quite understood the implications of. So what I'm speaking of, if you look at, uh, for example, an E. coli that might be uh, have been isolated from the blood, uh, you'll see the breakpoint for Piperacillin Tazobactam is being 16 over 4. However, if you look at Pseudomonas, that particular breakpoint is 64 over 4. Now, for me, uh, certainly Pseudomonas is generally a bacteria that has a higher uh, amount of resistance, and it uh, now strikes me as a bit odd, as I'm thinking about it, that the MICs might be uh, uh, fourfold higher for Pseudomonas as opposed to Enterobacteriaceae. You know, the normal teaching point I make for infectious disease fellows treating pseudomonal infections is that you don't need Piperacillin Tazobactam because the beta-lactamase component, the Tazobactam, isn't necessary uh, when treating pseudomonas and you can use Piperacillin alone. However, uh, when I uh, discussed this with Sarah Cosgrove and did a little more investigation, it seems that years ago, of course, most of the initial uh, studies with Piperacillin Tazobactam, especially with Pseudomonas, were done in combination with aminoglycoside therapy. And so the uh, old uh, clinical standards uh, that were established at that time uh, assume that pseudomonas uh, infections would be treated with a combination of aminoglycoside as well as Piperacillin Tazobactam, therefore setting the breakpoint higher. Now, nowadays, although aminoglycosides might be used empirically, uh, often we shy away from using them, and, and in fact, uh, often we'll use monotherapy to treat uh, most pseudomonal infections. So uh, the uh, clinical and laboratory standards uh, uh, institute, the so-called CLSI that sets breakpoints, has been under uh, some discussion now for over a year as to whether these breakpoints should be adjusted downwards to the 16 over 4 amount for pseudomonas. Now I've not seen any convincing data that's clearly said that uh, monotherapy with Piperacillin Tazobactam when you have pseudomonal isolates that have uh, MIC 90s of uh, 64 over 4 uh, indeed have worse outcomes or so on. However, I, I think as I now uh, treat uh, people in the hospital, I'll look a bit more closely at the actual MIC 90 and perhaps shy away from using Piperacillin Tazobactam for Pseudomonas if I see some of the higher MIC values. I uh, think it might be interesting uh, to see if this is an issue in your own practices and of course uh, if these breakpoints do change there may be some lessening of the apparent uh, susceptibility profiles of Piperacillin Tazobactam against Pseudomonas which historically have uh, maintained quite good levels but of course may uh, be less so if the breakpoints were to be revised downwards. Some food for thought and uh, thank you very much for listening.